Hi, I'm Ranger Becca. Today we're going to talk about some of the people whose stories and voices we don't always hear about when we talk about the Battle of Fredericksburg. Often, when we talk about the battle, we talk about it from the perspective of soldiers. And this makes sense. They were directly engaged in combat, and they wrote a wealth of primary sources in the form of letters, diaries, reports, memoirs about their experiences. Here at Fredericksburg, we also have the benefit of civilian accounts from non-combatants who experienced the battle and wrote about it afterwards. But if we were to rely solely on firsthand accounts of the battle, we would actually only have a partial image of who was here when the battle occurred. So what about the people whose accounts we don't always hear? Their experiences were certainly important and the war transformed their lives no less profoundly. Today, we're gonna to talk about some of the people who didn't leave firsthand accounts of the battle, but who we know were here when the battle occurred. We're starting today here at the Bernard's Cabin Trailhead. If you walk down this trail, you'll actually get to the site, uh, the former site of the Bernard's Cabins, which were cabins that housed enslaved people on the Mansfield Plantation Complex. Mansfield no longer exists. We're here today because soldiers of the 6th Wisconsin wrote about a man named Matthew Bernard, who was enslaved here at Mansfield prior to the outbreak of the war. According to what Matthew told Union soldiers and those soldiers later repeated, Matthew had been enslaved by a man named Arthur Bernard, the owner of Mansfield. He had gotten married to a woman who was also enslaved here at Mansfield and together they had had a daughter. However, Arthur Bernard decided that he was going to sell Matthew's wife farther south. As you can imagine, Matthew tried to convince Arthur not to do this. Arthur did it anyway. This was a very common occurrence in slavery. Families were often torn apart, as were marriages. And in response, Matthew told Arthur that the first opportunity he got, he would leave Mansfield. According to what Matthew told Union soldiers and those Union soldiers later repeated, that opportunity came for Matthew in the summer of 1862 when the Union Army arrived here in Fredericksburg. We don't know when over the course of that summer Matthew ran into Union lines, but in the summer of 1862, Union policy towards enslaved people and emancipation was changing. In July of 1862, Congress passed and President Lincoln signed the Second Confiscation Act, which among other things offered freedom to enslaved people who belonged to disloyal owners and who managed to flee into Union lines. So by going into Union lines, Matthew had not only escaped from Mansfield, but he had made himself free. At that point, Matthew became a cook for the Sixth Wisconsin, which was a very common occurrence. Many newly free black men decided to labor for the Union Army in some capacity. And it was this decision to stay with the Sixth Wisconsin that brought Matthew back here to Fredericksburg in December of 1862. The Sixth Wisconsin was stationed right here at Mansfield, uh, with the Iron Brigade during the Battle of Fredericksburg. So Matthew was returning to the very place from which he had escaped, but this time he was a free man. We don't know what Matthew's uh, experience was like because we don't have his account, but we do know that it left an impression on Union soldiers because multiple Union soldiers wrote about this man, Matthew Bernard, who had been enslaved and had returned to the place from which he had escaped. We also know that at this point, Matthew encountered Arthur Bernard because Arthur had been arrested by Union soldiers. So again, even though we don't have Matthew's account of this experience, we can only imagine what it was like to encounter his former enslaver who had now been arrested by the Union Army. Unfortunately, Matthew did not survive the war. According to the Union soldiers who told his story, he accompanied the 6th Wisconsin back to Milwaukee on a 30-day furlough where he contracted smallpox and passed away. So as far as we know, he is buried somewhere, likely in an unmarked grave in Milwaukee. So we are here for our second stop at Marie's Heights overlooking the city of Fredericksburg because we don't actually know where the next two people we're going to talk about lived. We know that they lived here somewhere in the city we know that they were here around the time of the Battle of Fredericksburg, and we know that they were neighbors, but we don't know exactly where their houses were. Both Patterson Barksley and George Madowney were enslaved prior to the outbreak of the Civil War, and both men managed to purchase their freedom in 1861. We know about them because they both submitted claims to the Southern Claims Commission when the war was over. 
So even though we don't have an account of their immediate experience of the Battle of Fredericksburg, we do actually have a sense of the impact that the war had on their lives and what it was like for them living here in Fredericksburg during the war. The Southern Claims Commission was created by the federal government to allow loyal Southerners who could prove their loyalty to the Union cause to submit claims for damages for property that was confiscated by the Union Army during the war. So for example, if you were a loyal shop owner in the South and some of your goods were taken by the Union Army to feed Union soldiers, after the war was over, you could submit a claim for compensation for what had been taken. So both Patterson Barksley and George Madowney did that. Patterson Barksley testified to the commission that he had been enslaved here in the city of Fredericksburg working as a hostler. In urban environments like Fredericksburg, it was fairly common for enslaved people to be what was called hired out. What this meant was that you worked for somebody other than the person who claimed ownership of you, and the person who claimed ownership of you got the compensation for your labor. In some cases, such as Barksley's, enslaved people could work extra and earn money that they kept for themselves. This is what Barksley did, and it's with this money that Barksley purchased his freedom. We know that he was here around the time of the battle because he testified to the Southern Claims Commission that around the middle of the war, he was pressed into service for the Confederate Army, loading iron onto boats. We also know that when Barksley purchased his freedom, he joined a fairly large free black population here in the city of Fredericksburg. According to the 1860 census, about 11% of Fredericksburg's total free population were identified as people of color. George Madowney also purchased his freedom in 1861 and remained here in the city working at whatever jobs he could find. Madowney was also pressed into service for the Confederate Army around the middle of the war, uh, moving railroad iron for the Confederate Army. This was a fairly common occurrence. Both free and enslaved black men could be forced into labor for the Confederate Army. Uh, they were not soldiers, but they did do manual labor that soldiers likely didn't want to do. So this happened to both men, uh, but they also specified that after the first time, they made sure not to be around when the impressment agents came looking for laborers. Now you might wonder why two men who had managed to purchase their freedom chose to stay in a place like Fredericksburg during the war. It doesn't necessarily seem like the most hospitable place, certainly not the safest place to be. Uh, and there are many reasons why uh, free people of color may have chosen to stay here in the city of Fredericksburg. First, unlike white residents, their opportunities to leave the city were limited. If you were a white civilian fleeing the battle from Fredericksburg, you could reasonably assume that you would find shelter in the home of another white family, family member, people that you knew out in broader Spotsylvania County or farther south. If you were a free black person, you likely didn't have those kinds of options. Conversely, if you were to go north of battle lines into the Union lines, uh, you could be impressed into service for the Union Army as well. And depending on the circumstances, you may or may not get paid for your labor. At this point in the war, black men could not enlist as soldiers in the Union Army. So likely by staying here in Fredericksburg, they maintained more control over their labor and their immediate circumstances. However, George Madowney's testimony before the Southern Claims Commission actually points us to a far more pressing reason why somebody might have chosen to stay here in Fredericksburg. Madowney, in testifying to his loyalty to the Union cause, told the Southern Claims Commission, I was always a Union man, and I always believed that the Union Army would set my family free. And with that, Madowney is telling us that his family remained enslaved at this point in the war. So likely, by staying in Fredericksburg, Madowney was maintaining his best opportunity to keep in contact with his family. Even if he didn't have contact with them, by staying in Fredericksburg, he likely maintained his best opportunity to be reunited with them when the war was over. For our final stop, we're here at Prospect Hill to talk about some of the people who didn't have the opportunity to claim freedom prior to the Battle of Fredericksburg. In fact, the majority of enslaved people remained enslaved when the Civil War ended. We get only glimpses of their stories through secondhand accounts. For example, Francis Gulrich, a white resident of the city of Fredericksburg, remembered fleeing the city during the battle. She remembered that the people her family enslaved remained with the family up until they got into the outskirts of the city. 
At that point, the enslaved people took the opportunity to go, quote, other directions. Gorick's choice to use the phrase other directions was likely her way of telling her readers that they took the opportunity to flee to freedom that was presented by the chaos of the battle. Charles Lyser of the 48th Pennsylvania wrote about seeing an enslaved man, quote, deserting from the Confederate army immediately after the Battle of Fredericksburg. Lyser's choice to use the term deserting actually tells us a lot about this man's potential status. As we've discussed, black men could not be soldiers in the Confederate army, but the Confederate army did often impress both free and enslaved black laborers. So more than likely, this person that Lyser observed was taking the opportunity to swim across the river into Union lines and claim freedom because the Union Army remained across the river through the winter of 1862 into 1863. Still, others didn't have the opportunity to claim, to claim freedom at all. Franklin Sauter of the 55th Ohio wrote about seeing black men working on Confederate earthworks after the Battle of Fredericksburg was over. Again, this was very common and following the Battle of Fredericksburg, the Confederate Army put black laborers back to work, strengthening their position here in Fredericksburg. The fact that we know of so many different situations in which free and enslaved people found themselves during the Battle of Fredericksburg points us to an important reality about the war's relationship to slavery and freedom. Over the course of the first two years of war, federal policy towards slavery and emancipation was evolving, producing after the Battle of Fredericksburg, the official release of the Emancipation Proclamation. But the Emancipation Proclamation could not end the institution of slavery. It could only offer freedom to people who had the opportunity to claim it. A person's ability to claim that freedom depended not just on their geographic location and their proximity to the Union Army, but also, as we see here at Fredericksburg, on their individual circumstances. And again, as we see here at Fredericksburg, we often only glimpse portions of their stories through secondhand accounts. <laughs>